Um, appreciate everybody's time. Um, I'll jump right into this. The purpose is mentioned is to explain this new tool that's emerging called a data dashboard. Uh, I'd like to begin really by explaining what it is, approaching it from kind of historical, from a background perspective. It's best to understand how all this emerged, because about a year ago, we weren't even talking about these dashboards, but now they seem to be catching on pretty quick. Um, Let's see, let me get back to my screen. There we go. So the background really began with the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports, along with the Western's, let's call it the Marketing Subcommittee. It's a pretty long acronym right there. The council, as you know, is charged with facilitating a national plan to encourage greater participation in the shooting sports. Um, what we want to do here is, over time, is get various groups engaged on how to improve participation at the state level, and then working regionally, cooperatively, and ultimately national. So the WAFL has been discussing as part of this about maybe the last year or two, and I can't give the details, only that they could there. What they wanted to do was to develop plans, but in their discussions, they realized they need some way of monitoring. Um, they would need some way of tracking, are these efforts actually working at the state level and regional level? Because if you think about it, if you're in a state fish and wildlife agency, all you need to do is to, um, you need to be able to know, excuse me a second, here, let me turn this off. Um, all we can really do is um, look at our own license data because our other information outside state agency comes out once every five years. And that's not good enough for our three plans. We need to know within a month or three at the most, are our programs really working? State license databases, if you work with them, you know they can be very cumbersome. They're not quick and easy to analyze. So getting feedback often from your own state's license database can be difficult. So to do this, the idea was to have a scorecard. The scorecard is basically a series of metrics that explains um, what is happening in the way of license sales across particular user, user groups. Um, the scorecard, um, after discussions with the WAFWA, was developed by um, Oregon. They volunteered to put the first one together. And this is what they have in the way of a scorecard. Don't try to read the details. I, I don't put this up here so you can actually see the details in the scorecard. But what it has is it tracks, the, if you can see my cursor here, total number of customers, these are you know, licensed buyers, and it breaks it down by type of licensed buyer, breaks it down by age and gender, or breaks it down by where they live, by county, and so forth in the state, and then it breaks down further and further. So altogether, these are the metrics that would help a state understand where are they going in the way of license sales, and are there R3 efforts actually working? Now, what's scary about this scorecard is Okay. All right. So what you actually see overall is the um, the scorecard is well. I'm showing the screen. Excuse me. I'm a little distracted for a second. This scorecard is actually about three pages worth. It's a lot of information. And if you can just imagine the number of charts and pages that come out of it are huge. In fact, the first scorecard we developed, South Lake Associates under contract, Oregon, we developed a scorecard was a stack of well over a hundred pages of Excel tables. It is a production nightmare. Uh, take a long, it took a long time to not just run the data, but then to format it and put it into, for, to, into tables so actually can read it. And then you're left with this 100 plus page report that really becomes an interpretation challenge. It's hard to understand it because it's just a lot of information to sort through. And as you all probably know, when you have a thick report, very few folks are probably going to read it. And then you end up with, again, you're back to where you were before, not knowing if your license sales are really moving as a result of your R3 efforts. Let's go ahead and change slides and go to the next one. Okay, so what we have this need is for a simpler scorecard. Because again, the first one we produced was a series of Excel charts that took all the information that the Western Committee was saying would be needed to help track participation, help identify if R3 efforts were working. And we need a simpler scorecard that was quicker to produce, because producing all those Excel charts took about two or three months. By then, the data is almost out of date and need to be cost effective because all that labor takes a lot of, it costs money. So a simpler scorecard was needed. 
So what we ended up with is this data dashboard approach. And that's our staff here, some of the younger staff. It's a nice thing about bringing kids in just a year or two out of college to come with great ideas. And go ahead and the, so we use is Tableau software in this case. Tableau is a, it's a pricey program. We have the license here, but it's a lot like Adobe. The Adobe readers most people have where the Adobe license itself is, is a pricey license, but then anybody can download the free reader software to able to read and manipulate the actual tables produced by the main program. So it's for folks who just want to read and access the data, it's a free software package. Go ahead. Um, I do want to stress at this point that these data dashboards are both pushing hunting and fishing equally. And for states also have authority over boating, trapping, shellfish, and so forth, um, those elements also be included. We're not limiting this to just hunting. Um, okay, let's click to the next slide. Um, next one, please. So a dashboard, kind of the summary is, it gives you visual feedback, quick visual insights into what's happening. Go ahead. So what you have in a dashboard, it's like a dashboard in a car. It is a series of gauges and dials that give you a quick read into what's going on under the hood. And it can be pretty complicated under the hood. So these dials make it simple to understand. So you here you have, you can have gauges or dials that show you the trends in participation, the number of participants or the percentage of the population that does it. The next one shows values. It could be a very simple gauge that gives you a quick read into the number of licensed buyers from a particular type of license or trends over time. And thirdly, we have distributions. You can have gauges in there that show you how things vary over time. So all these di different gauges, you select the ones that are most important to your R3 efforts, you build them into your dashboard, you produce the dashboard on a quarterly basis. Now everyone in your agency is getting a fast, quick read into what is happening in the way of license sales, and it gives you the quick ability to monitor the effect of your R3 programs. You may be targeting a particular niche. Let's say you're targeting women under 35 for hunting licenses. You can have gauges that show you quick, quickly what has happened in the last quarter, the last year, the last 10 years. So you can see, are things starting to change because your R3 efforts? And if not, then you have the quick mean, the means to understand where changes may, may need to be made to your R3 efforts. And eventually we end up with a much more effective um, R3 program that returns higher returns than it would without this kind of monitoring and evaluation tool. Let's go to the next slide. So what we have here is, this is the actual dashboard, the first one we produced for Oregon. So after working with Chris Willard, and he really, I have to give credit to Chris for leading this effort, uh, for being the brains and the leader behind the first scorecard with his, with his um, counterparts in other Western states. As I mentioned before, we were um, working with Oregon at the time on some other license work, and they asked us to put together that first scorecard. Then our staff said, there's got to be a better way than this thick stack of Excel charts. And this is the first dashboard we produced for them. So what you see on the top of the dashboard is you can pick what is it you want your gauges to show you. So you can select their hunting, for example. You can also pick fishing. You could pick, um, in Oregon's case, they have it customized for shellfish. You can pick the type of license. You can pick turkey permits. That's what you have in your state. Um, you can pick bow hunting or salmon licenses, whatever you have in your particular state. You can select the quarter you want to see the results for. It depends on how you develop in your state. The fourth quarter could show you the whole year together or just the quarter itself. And then, of course, over time, you're going to be able to select the year. Most states, we suggest when they develop the first dashboard, they have at least two years on there for comparison purposes. So what you see here on this first page is four columns of information. This is the initial information that the WAFO is thinking is going to be critical that all states produce. Let's call this the standard information. We'll come back to it in a minute, but we're hoping all states can produce a standard set of information. The final standard data will be um, is being refined further by the Western Committee, and I believe they might be working with the Midwestern too. I don't want to speak out of turn there, um, but there's still some work going on in that area. But you see the top left column is participation. It's very straightforward. It's a quick gauge that shows you the number of participants by year. The next one to the right shows participation rate. 
the participation rate um, is the actual percentage of state population who's buying, in this case, a hunting license. So the idea is over time you can determine whether hunting, in this case, is remaining relevant or not statewide, politically, socially. You can see it was dropping down to about 2011, but since then we're starting to see an increase. We're hoping, of course, through good R3 efforts to keep that increase growing. The next box is new recruits. Remember, this is part of the R3 program. And R3, if you're not familiar, is recruitment, retention, and reactivation. So this box tracks the new recruits, the recruitment aspect. And it shows the number of new recruits, people who have not noticed buying a license in the last five or 10 years, depends on your state data, the number of new people we're seeing coming in buying a license. And we're seeing a nice increase there in Oregon. That's, that's good, kudos to Oregon. And the last column is the churn rate. This is part of the retention aspect of R3. We want to be able to sell a license to the person in one year and have them come back the next year. And we have learned through all the R3 efforts undertaken, whether it's through the council, through the National Shooting Sports Foundation, through the RBFF on the fishing side, it is very clear, if you're not active and encouraging your license buyers to return, many, many of them will not. So this is an important gauge as we need programs to track our churn rates and try to lower that churn rate. Um, let's go on to the next, next slide. All right, so below, again, this index is quite, is quite long. And so um, below the first page I showed you is the details you have available on a dashboard. It can track not just number of participants who buy hunting licenses, but it is important, the Western Committee is saying, to know what is happening by age, because it's probably in many cases we're going to see intervention efforts required uh, for particular segments of our license buying customer base. So the millennial generation, those are folks from 18 to 35, they may need a certain rate because we see their participation is dropping in Oregon. But we see increases in the older folks down below. Well, that's kind of scary as folks 65 and older, older either don't have to buy a license in many states or have to buy a, buy a lower priced license. So our three efforts may focus in this case on the millennial crew, trying to get them to participate more. So it gives you the details you need to know, are your programs effective? You design your program, you implement it, and then over time, this data dashboard can show you what is the trend. Are we making those downward slopes turn and start going up? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I appreciate everyone's bearing with us here listening. You probably picked up, we had a little confusion in the beginning of this um, webinar. And what has happened is through a series of text messages, Samantha, and Marty, and Donna here have been troopers and have um, realized the control had to be handled by a different computer. So I applaud them for the quick reaction and keeping this thing rolling. But if anything was missed or confused in the beginning, we will have a chance for questions so we can clear up any points that were missed. So uh, I thank the team here behind and here making this work, given we're scattered all over the country. Okay, and so yes, Marty, we'll, we'll get yours there at the end, it looks like. Oh, let's pass it on to me. Um, all right, so each dashboard, what I showed you was the standard information we're hoping all states can collect. We'll come back to that in a minute, but the dashboard can be customized to provide any information you may need within your state. It is your tool, it is your state, it is your R3 program. So examples of customized information you can build into it include um, hunter ed grads. We do know that hunter ed grads, um, two thirds tend to quit after about three years of graduating. Now we speculate many states may implement retention efforts to keep our hunter ed grads actually hunting. The next thing we could, your state could include in there might be ways of tracking your controlled hunts or your big game draws. Um, bigger need out west versus the eastern states, but we do have a lot of special hunts in the eastern states and fishing opportunities that you may want to track over time. Uh, yes, we'll come back to NGO. That's a good question. Spin up there at the end, NGOs. Oh. So in other words, some states have unique licenses. For Oregon, for example, has a shell fishing license. You can build that into your, your, your data dashboard. Go ahead. Next click. Um, a lot of folks want to have county level insights. County level data won't be as important at the regional and national level, which we'll touch on in a second. 
But at the state level, absolutely, because a lot of your R3 efforts may be focused on more suburban or rural areas, whatever the important need that you see. Go ahead and click it. What we have here is an example of what the regional or uh, county level can look like. So you can see we have the four basic types of information, but at the county level. So you can see in Oregon where the density of licensed buyers are clustered. And of course, that's, those are in the urban areas in the western part of the state. But the next chart shows you where you have a higher percentage of the population who tends to buy hunting licenses. Not surprisingly, that is in the rural areas. The next chart shows where our new recruits are coming from. Based on pure numbers, they're still happening in the urban areas. But good R3 efforts, if they can focus on other counties, maybe our dashboards can show us, if you have them in place, if the programs are succeeding or not. And if they're not, you know it's time to make a tweak, a change to your program. And of course, churn rates. We can see where the churn rates are the worst. It tends to be still more in the more urbanized areas, not necessarily, but we eventually want to see those um, rates go down to gray across the state, ideally. All right, let's go ahead and slightly change the theme here. So the dashboards is not just a tool for the state agency. They are the primary beneficiary of a dashboard. Um, same kind of thing can be used for NGOs who can track uh, what membership trends are. They can track uh, responses to their own R3 efforts. Maybe they're driving leads, people who want to learn to hunt. That gets passed on to the state agency to recruit them into hunter ed programs. So dashboards can be used by NGOs also in their R3 efforts. And ideally, we can coordinate the efforts. But we're really um, at the regional and national level, whether it's WAFWA or whether it's the council nationally, we want to be able to track participation um, in hunting, especially in the shooting sports. We had the same need um, with other partners, National Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, we want to know what is the trend in hunting participation overall, because we have to deal with the media on behalf of all the states and NGOs out there, keep the positive message out to the public that hunting is relevant and efforts are underway to increase participation. Um, there are other efforts already going on. Um, the AFWA, for example, has been talking among its own committees about how to integrate state license data to be able to better track these trends regionally and nationally. And of course, the, R3, um, the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports has its own national R3 plan, where one of the major pillars is to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness to identify improvements. So this tool kind of falls in at the right time to help these major groups meet their needs. To help all this happen, um, I got to say first, um, the National Shooting Sports Foundation provides seed money for Oregon and a couple other states now under development to develop a data dashboard to see if we could take those complicated scorecards and put them into electronic format. So um, a thank you goes out to the NSSF to help test this effort to see if it works. And so far, indications are, are very, very positive. Since then, the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports has seen this tool as something to help its members and among the states to not only track their own efforts, but then to be able to know what's happening nationally. And think about it nationally. We're at the point now where we only know whether hunting is going up or down and, and fishing every five years. Um, we have some license data, from certified license data. There's some issues there too. But so far in those years, we don't have the data. Other people are speaking for us. And those other people speaking for hunting and fishing may not be friendly to the future of hunting and outdoor recreation. So this gives us a chance to speak for ourselves if we actually have facts to speak to. Um, so that helps both again, everybody in our community, not just the council. So the council wants to be, is, is going to act as a facilitator to help encourage states, go ahead, to develop dashboards um, at, within each state level. Um, the council is working to encourage states to collect that basic set of information so we can build dashboards at the regional and national level. Um, they're also working to um, try to have states to develop, develop these on a quarterly basis, given the seasonal nature of hunting and fishing. And then once we have a number of states producing dashboards to actually lead the effort to develop a regional and national picture. Go ahead, Sam. Um, so to summarize overall what the dashboards are doing for us, go ahead, hit the first one. It provides us a quick visual insight into license sales. From a complicated set of tables, it gives us quick visual gauges and dials to see what's really happening. Happening. This makes it simpler to monitor um, R3 efforts, but also is more than R3. It helps states monitor where the revenues are coming from and where opportunities might lie to boost revenues. 
Go ahead. Um, it's also going to um, give us to not just a national picture. Go ahead and click the next one. I already covered this one here. Go to the next. There you go. It's important to note that the dashboard is meant to monitor, to track your ongoing R3 efforts. There are so many different avenues and paths a state agency can take individually. States in the Northeast, for example, more urbanized efforts may be targeting different audiences than, let's say, states in the Great Plains area. Different cultures, if you will, towards hunting, different composition of their public, whether it's urban, rural, um, more of an outdoor orientation or not. Each one's going to have a unique R3 approach. To identify the best approach a state should take, it's going to take more than a dashboard. We highly encourage states to get into their raw license data and do a, com a comprehensive mining effort to identify where their true opportunities lie. Then your dashboard, you have gauges built that will track your targeted approaches. So the data dashboard monitors, helps you evaluate if your R3 programs are working. You need to do your upfront work to identify what are your optimal R3 strategies. So I just want people to understand the R3, the data dashboard does not tell you which way you should go. It tells you, is it working? Should you make improvements? All right, go ahead and click the last slide. Um, so at this point, we'll go to questions. And Sam, if you're able to speak here, do you want to moderate the questions? If not, um, if I don't hear anything, we'll go from here. So uh, <clears throat> this is Marty with uh, Powderhook, and I'm going to be the one uh, kind of asking questions. And um, if everybody, if you have questions now, please type them off onto the right-hand side uh, with the, on the chat box. Um, we're just going to kind of go from the top and go down. Uh, Rob, you might have touched on a couple of these, but if you don't mind, uh, just kind of repeating yourself a little bit, just so we uh, can get all the questions answered. Um, the first question is one of my own. Uh, I was wondering, how hard is it to implement the dashboard at first? Um, what kind of changes do um, folks need to make to their databases in order to use it? Um, do they need to start tracking additional things? Um, just kind of, how, how does that whole database structure work? Okay, um, well, that's a good question. What I'll use Oregon for example. State doesn't need to, does not need to modify their own license database. What we do is we take a full pool of the license database here at Southwick Associates. We have worked with over 40 state license databases already. We take the data as it as is, and then we'll restructure it to work within Tableau, and we develop the matrix that provides the basic information that's needed. So the first effort, the first time a, a dashboard is developed, is complex. It takes a little bit of time, and of course, that's higher cost. It's been about fifteen thousand dollars per state. But once that design is in place, the updates done quarterly are about half the price and are much quicker to turn around. So the state doesn't need to modify its license database; it just passes off a copy to us, and we take care of it here. I kind of uh, you kind of touched on another one of my questions I had. Um, so I was I was just wondering what are Oregon's first impressions with the dashboard, um, and then what are are you guys? You said you update it quarterly. Are those like um, big updates? Are are you guys still uh, modifying the data dashboards, adding more features and whatnot? Um, yeah, we can certainly modify. We have been doing that as we learn more about them. First time you do anything, you, know, you, you always expect modifications as you improve it as, 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 as it matures. Um, I can't speak for Oregon. Uh, Chris Willer in Oregon has been our contact. Um, been great to work with, you know, providing us insights about where the values and benefits are. I wish we could claim credit for all this, but it's really working with him that led all this to happen. Um, he seems pleased. He's been referring other states to work work with us, and I really don't want to go beyond that. I don't want the words in, in their mouth. Okay. So Brett Thompson asked, um, "Can you track by each NGO's effort?" And I'm assuming he's wondering if um, the state agency can track individual NGOs' efforts going on in their state. Um, you, you said that you could apply this to an NGO um, for them to use personally, internally. But I'm wondering if you can. He's wondering, I think, if you can track different NGOs' efforts going on around your state. Um, well, you only can track, of course, as far as the data will take you. Um, and states only maintain license sales data. 
So let's say I'll just randomly pick out an NGO, the Rocky Mountain Health Foundation. And if they're on a big campaign to boost the number of people who are applying for elk hunts, and they have an R3 effort and or say recruitment effort underway to get more folks to participate, then yes, the state could track if the number of permits is increasing. And let's say they run the campaign during a particular time period. Let's say they run it during March and April. Um, then, then we can also go to the data dashboard, look at the demand monthly um, for permits or maybe a draw if it's during the draw season, and they can time it. So in that way, the state can help an NGO understand if its efforts are working or not. The other NGO approach is a lot of states or a lot of NGOs, excuse me, are very active now in R3 efforts overall. Um, so we can track efforts by county, we can track efforts by target demographic, you know, male, female, age, um, by type of license, and so forth. Um, the whole concept of data dashboard, of course, can be applied. NGOs can apply that internally too to their own membership recruitment tools and have the same kind of dials that show what's going on with their with their efforts. So Matt Harlow wants to know, um, is it possible to look at groups of people who have bought uh, multiple licenses? So maybe a hunting and a fishing license or a fishing and a boating license, just to and see what their um, kind of habits are and their tendencies. Can you track that and see what's going on there? If a state requests, yes. Uh, we've done that for individual state analysis. We can look at um, actual number of unique customers and report them by whether they're single or multiple purchasers or whether they purchase a type of privilege, say fishing or hunting. Um, it hasn't been done yet, but that could easily be done on a state's custom page or if the community decides to do that nationally, that can certainly be done. So you guys are pretty flexible in what, what you can report back to the states based on what they want to do. And that, that kind of goes along with that initial initial setting up of the dashboard where you guys would have to go in and um, you know you know mine all the databases get all the right information and then you know make those comparisons and display them on the dashboard um, you can you can do a lot with that right for each individual state as uh, like kind of customizing it yes yes yeah we, we, we certainly can that's it. however they want it to report it we can put it together um, what I showed on the screen was a very simple dashboard, just with the basic information. We call that page one. Um, we have some states now look at may have two or three pages of detail behind it to cover such things that are important to them. So if the data, if the raw data is in a license database, um, we can present it. And that includes doing combinations, you know, looking at unique buyers, um, looking at buyers based on their past history. You know, are they people who tend to buy most years? Are they people who tend to just you know, disappear for a year or two at a time? Mm. That, that's possible. Great. And I think uh, you had touched on this, but you said they're uh, updated quarterly? That's a recommendation. The, the council is recommending that they're updated quarterly. The states we're working with right now, we haven't get underdeveloped. Oregon's developed. We have four more underway, three more in line after that. Um, and yes, the recommendation is to do it quarterly, given the seasonal nature of outdoor participation. Um, and so you update every quarter. Of course, each quarterly update can be broken out down to the month, as you saw in some of the, the demos there. But if you start going out longer, say six months or even one year, sometimes it's really hard to tell when the changes really happen or it doesn't give you a chance to really respond quick enough. So the council is recommending at this point to do these quarterly. And you said you recommend having two years worth of data to start out with? Yeah, yeah, you need something to compare to. You need a baseline, um, you know, and, and also you have, for example, spring fishing. If you have a very wet year, one year, um, or late melt, it can really affect sales. And it starts making it harder to, to look at what happened in one particular year. You always need something to compare to, some kind of some base number. And two years gives you a much better read on the trends and allows you to account for unique events such as a late snow melt or a very dry fall, et cetera. And you said that this was a dashboard not to find places to focus your efforts, but more on a, a way to evaluate how your efforts are doing? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, technically, you could use a dashboard to identify where you want to implement R3 efforts. But our fear, as we discuss this, is you might miss some unique opportunities. 
Uh, an example, we are seeing in some initial work, I can't name the states yet, we haven't released it, but it looks like there's a real strong increase in the number of millennials from suburban areas who are buying fishing licenses, in some cases, hunting licenses. But we're not seeing that everywhere. Well, if you didn't really mine down into your data in the beginning, you might not even produce that gauge on your dashboard to identify that particular audience, and you might miss a great marketing opportunity. And so a dashboard is much better to track your R3 programs. Your R3 programs are much better if you develop them based on a really strategic review of all your license data, a real detailed um, analysis. So then the detailed analysis tells you where your best opportunities lie, and then you have the data dashboard tracking those audiences that you're targeting, and then tracking your major audiences all together. So if you see things shift over time, maybe you know it's, hey, it's time to go back into the data and really assess which direction we're going. So dashboards so, tell you, are you on track? They suggest maybe if there's a better track, but it's your customized data analysis up front that tells you what is your optimal track to pursue. So when you go, when you start you know, working with the state, start setting up these data dashboards, is that part of your process? Do you go in with them, kind of mine down, <clears throat> mine down the data and you know, kind of come up with a plan with them, or is that kind of all on the states to come up with where they want their focuses to be, and then you guys kind of come in and just pull the right data? <clears throat> Do you guys kind of help them analyze their data that they have now, is what I'm kind of asking? Um, we do with some states. We did that with Oregon. Um, we're doing that uh, with Massachusetts right now, where they do a dashboard. They'll, they'll determine, of course. Um, we have done that on behalf of RBFF and NSSF for other states. Some states can do it on their own. Some states have staff and capabilities. Um, we're, we are available, of course, but that's, that's a different effort outside the dashboards. Mm, okay. So Astrid has a question. Uh, is this tool mostly used for large-scale marketing in communication efforts, or has it been used to evaluate the effectiveness of smaller R3 programs? Um, well, the dashboard are just coming into play right now, so the very beginning stage. So the idea is it will they'll track state-level R3 efforts. I don't know how you define small-scale and large-scale, um, but they're going to be used at the state level. We're going to just beginning right now. Okay. All right. Ryan has a question. With the differences between states, how are you? How are all these reports made consistent? For example, participation can mean several different things. Just depends on which state you talk to. So, how are you guys kind of dealing with the differences between states and whatnot? Um. Well, I guess every state is going to be different. We're asking that core information be provided by all the states. And that'll be more of your top level. You know, ID, number of hunting licenses sold by age, um, by gender, some basic breakouts, you know, same, same for fishing. But then each state is going to want to have their own details, such as Oregon. They have a shellfish license. I think there's only one or two other states that have such a thing. It is important to them, though. It's a big part of the revenue. So. Most state data dashboards, if you line them all up together, will be different. But you'll find maybe four or five core elements that should be common across all the states. The course is the state's decision whether they do that or not. We're, we're requesting, we being at the, I'm speaking for the council at this point, the council's asking all states to at least track that common data across all the states so we can develop this regional and national picture. And that information then can be used to help recruit say, corporate partners to our R3 efforts to help us be more effective or help allow us to speak for ourselves instead of other people speaking for us. Did that get the nature of your question? Uh, yeah, he, he kind of followed up with another question. So he wants to know if you guys have defined those co common elements that are, you know, pretty universal between states. Um, who will define those elements, you're saying? So, um, so have you defined, like, so, like, I guess a, a basic license would be like one thing that is common between the states. You know, they might have different licenses for different animals, but um, pretty much, you know, license would be one thing. Are there other things like that that go pre, is pretty much universal universal between all states? It would have to be top level, of course. And we, for example, we could not have track archery um, permits across all the states because not all states have those. 
So it will be something a little higher level, such as hunting, hunting privilege. Now, whether hunting privilege is packaged as a, you know, a three month, let's say a short term, like a 14 day license or annual license, it would probably be packaged just as privilege. There is, um, as I understand with the council, again, Sam can speak this much more effectively than I can, a task force that's put together to develop such a standard. So that question's already come up within council discussions. And they do have a group of states. I think Wisconsin might be leading that effort among with some other states and other NGOs to develop those standards that what can be tracked effectively across all the states to give us that commonality. I, and I can okay. speak to that as well, Rob. Um, we are addressing that because the, if you look at the scorecard um, that was developed a while, uh, about a year and a half ago, as part of the national effort, and it has a ton of uh, metrics to track on your programs and get a good idea of what's going on. But um, the, like Rob said, the standard ones about like archery, not every state has that. What we're doing is going through and trying to identify which ones can apply to everyone and are good indications at the national and the regional level of what's going off place and sales. So we can use that as a metric of participation in overall R3 efforts. So we're working on that. We haven't established that yet, but it is it is a, on our radar and we're trying to identify those. All right. Um, great. So we had a couple questions come in about the pricing structure. Can you just kind of talk through how you know the pricing model works for states? Right. Um, so as I mentioned before, developing that first dashboard is by far the most complex effort because we'll take the entire state license database as it's delivered by the state. We don't ask the state to do any modifications to it. And then we work with the state to identify um, so a series of phone calls with the state, what are the key elements they want to track in the data dashboard and what's unique to their state. Um, then we craft the basic data matrix, the best way of describing it. So we'll develop the data matrix, extracting from the state license database, and put that matrix together that Tableau needs. And then we, and that's tech, we're pricing that about $15,000 right now. Um, and then the updates, after that, each update at this point is being priced at about $7,500 each. Over time, as this becomes more standardized, prices may change as it becomes easier. But in the early stages right now, that's, that's where we stand. Um, so each state, so again, we first step is a complicated one. We develop the matrix that Tableau uses. We deliver that back to the state. They can share it with whoever they want inside, outside the agency, all their staff, selected staff. It's their, it's their dashboard. They decide who to share it with, and then they can manipulate that data, as I showed online, using the free software reader that Tableau provides. So when you say update, what all, go, what all is happening with an update? Is it just um, updating all your you know, license data, or is it like you know, modifying your data dashboards, changing them around? You know, what, what all goes into an update? Um, simplest update is the state just does another full extraction of the license data set, FTPs it to us, all that's kept secure, and then we'll, de we'll run, develop the next matrix. But the second time, of course, we already know what data to extract. We've already been through the discussions. We just develop the matrix, um, send it back. We do know that states will come back, especially the first couple of times, requesting additions to it. Other than once people in the agency see the first dashboard, most common reaction will be, wow, that's neat. Can you do this? Then we'll add something else to it. So we expect that to happen. So the updates will be repulling the data entirely. It's easiest for the state. They'll need to manipulate it. They just download the data set to us. We develop them, redevelop the matrix, but we can add in a few dashboards here and there as states see the need for additional information. And we, we do caution against having a state develop a gauge for any little thing they can imagine, or else they put themselves back in that situation of possible paralysis by analysis. You want to have the relevant gauges on your dashboard. If you have too many in there, the first-time user, it could be, say, a regional director for state agency, will look at it and say, this is too much for me to sort through, and they won't use it. Now you've lost some benefit of the program. So we do encourage states to be a little discerning about what they include and what they don't include. Um. Yeah, so 
we have a question from Ryan again. Uh, with Tableau, the data can be live. Why produce these reports incrementally? Why couldn't they be like live reports? Hello? Okay. Did we lose you? I'm just trying to volume. Just start losing a little bit volume wise. Can you repeat that question, please? Um, yeah. So with Tableau, uh, the data can be live. Why produce the reports incre incrementally? instead of live reports or real time? Well, this, you, to do a live system, you have to have someone constantly. The state license database is very large and very complex. The Tableau software has to go to a preset matrix to extract the information that it needs. So you have to first do the download from the state licensing data system and build the matrix. Um, and you could do that weekly if you wanted to. It just seems like that might be a necessary expenditure of money. If you have the ability, if you have the analytical staff on hand, and if you have the software, you could bring in something like a SaaS software, and you can do those live queries on your own. And big companies do that. A few states have that ability. The limiting factor is you have to be a trained analyst in order to how to use that software to manipulate it and get information out of there. And most folks involved in R3 effort in a state agency are not data analysts. They could be a regional fisheries biologist that's implementing a program to get more kids to go fishing. They're not going to have that ability to go in there and do the quick queries on their own. Dashboards allow anybody without having that kind of complex analytical training or software. This Tableau dashboard approach allows anyone to get in there and, and analyze the data. So yes, if you have the skill sets and you have the resources, there are ways of doing live queries on your data, but even then you're limited to the number of people who will actually be able to get in the data and see what they need to see in order to at least support, buy into the R3 efforts, or number two, actually hands-on make the adjustments to improve the program. So, Rob, I was wondering, um, you probably haven't run into this quite yet since it's kind of in a new thing going on, but <clears throat> So you go in and you set up this initial data dashboards. You know, you spend the 15 grand to get it all set up. Um, <clears throat> what happens two years down the road when uh, the person is, or the agency says, "Okay, we're we're on the wrong track. We're tracking the wrong thing. We need to, you know, kind of reshape what we're tracking and where we're going." Um, how would that kind of happen? And then would that be like another? Would that be considered another initial setup for you know another fifteen grand to do that, or is it a little different? Okay, well, well um, first of all, it's no problem to do that. As we mentioned before, the first dashboard we request states to at least have two years of data in their system. We could go back and build it for ten years. So it's no problem to go back retroactively and develop gauges in the dashboard that look at a new factor going back over time. The only requirement is the data have to be there. Mm. So if a state agency wants to change direction a couple years down the road, but wants trend information going back in time, that's not a problem. As for the cost, we have to talk with the state directly. I mean, if they're only asking to add three or four new gauges to the dashboard, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. There might be a slight extra cost, it may not be a cost at all. If they're looking at scrapping the whole thing and doing something completely different, which I think would be unusual, then yeah, we'd probably have to charge a fee to start all over again. So we we talk with the state, find out what it is they'd like to have reported, and then work with them from there. Okay. And uh, it looks like this is our last question, but uh, so Clark wants to know how does this kind of dish differ from a, a Google Analytics dashboard? Are there advantages to using this dashboard versus Google Analytics that you can identify? Um, well, yeah, yeah. Google Analytics, of course, is tracking activity on, on the internet, say a website. Um, this actually tracks your data within a, your licensed database. So it gives you an absolute read. Google Analytics, um, if you ever worked with it, it estimates. The numbers are not absolute. You, know, you have an idea of how many different types of people are coming into your website. It has to do multiple adjustments, various algorithms to give you, give you a good read. And it's an excellent program. We use it for tracking our own websites. But Google Analytics tracks internet usage. Dashboard tracks your trends within your licensed database. But your licensed database is absolute. 
I mean, it's, it's a census of all your license sales. It's not based on samples. It's not based on various algorithms for estimating participation. It is the actual licenses that you sold. Um, so the only thing where data that dashboard um, might miss the boat a little bit is participants who don't have to buy a license. You know, it could be minors, could be seniors. Um, but since most states are entering the R3 efforts, um, you know, half the reason is to maintain revenues. You, you want to track those licenses that generate revenues. So Google Analytics is just a different program for a different purpose, tracking web traffic, dashboards, tracks, license sales, traffic, if you will. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, it, it, pre it pretty much is Google Analytics for your actual licensed buyers databases. It, it, it was what it seems to me. Um, you get kind right. of the same, the same graphs, the same, you know, really uh, conclusive, you can draw conclusions really easily from the graphs and, you know, all the different um, numbers that they highlight and whatnot. So, and adding to that, just to be fair, for these tools are what they are, Google Analytics is live. It does, and it tells you immediately what's going on, and that's the limitation of Tableau. You know, the reader is always active, but it only can read that matrix that was created on a given point in time. So if, they're, if your updates are done every quarter, and that's the only can see, let's say the last quarter produced was you know, July through September, that's far back as you can go. And here we are in, in mid-October. You could see the first two weeks of October, you wait till the next matrix comes up. Again, you know, given the cost of having a real live tool, it's very expensive to take specialized training. It gives us these insights we've never had from state fish and wildlife agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> it's getting close to um, 2 p.m. now, and uh, we want to respect everybody's time. So, um, just want to say thank you, Rob, for you know doing this. Uh, it's been you know really insightful for people. I think. A lot of people, it sounds like people are excited about it and uh, it looks really cool. That was the first time I kind of got to see the whole spiel about it. So um, everybody else, um, thank you for joining and listening. And uh, we'll post this chat to um, the R3 site along with, we recorded this meeting. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and get that posted for you. Um, we, we do have another webinar coming up uh, November 15th. Uh, with Matt Dunphy. He'll be going over the outdoor recreation adoption model. Um, so that should be pretty interesting. It'll be a really similar format, hour long, um, just asking questions and uh, he'll answer as many uh, as he can. We do have a survey for you guys. Uh, to, if, you, if you don't mind taking it real quick, just to let us know how we did. We, we want to make sure that these webinars are you know, as informative and useful and not wasting your time uh, as possible. So uh, please help us out there. Um, sign up for the next webinar. And uh, I want to thank, you know, the team that put this together, Rob, Donna, Sam, uh, Cyrus. Uh, we uh, had a little bit of troubles testing out a couple different softwares. So it's been, uh, it's been troubling, but, you know, we got it. And, uh, well, next time it'll go a lot smoother. But uh, thanks, everybody. Um, please uh, tune in next time, November 15th. Thank you. Yep. Thanks.